Okay. Um, how's everybody doing? Um, anybody have any questions before we start? Um, anybody who has – I'm actually curious here. Uh, there's probably a lot of people who have um, followed me on YouTube, followed me, obviously, on BK, followed me on Twitter. Is anybody who's not familiar at all with what I do with, with, the, uh, with the RSI setup here? Just chime in because I want to know how, uh, how basic I need to become here in terms of talking about the stuff that I'm going to be doing. Okay. So we have a few people who just have no clue. All right. This is the first time Todd has got – we have a first-time uh, visitor here. For uh, for our seminar, so that's nice. Okay, so for the benefit of everybody, I'm gonna uh, first and foremost explain to you what I basically basically do. <laughs> Reinforcement through repetition. I like that. Okay, yes. Uh, you know, if you hit your head against the wall long enough, you will eventually make a hole, right? That's that's my method of trading, uh, right? Uh, as long as we uh, uh, hit our no 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 no. Um, all right, guys. So let me explain to you a little bit about what I do and how I trade. Um, those of you who follow me and those of you who are not know that primarily, or not even primarily, almost exclusively, I trade on an intraday basis. I find it very, very difficult to find long-term trends because I think it's extraordinarily difficult. I'm just not that smart to be able to predict long-term movements in currencies. We all know the basic themes. We all know the general underlying Forces. The problem is, for like in physics, for every for every basic underlying theme, there's a counter theme um, against it, and you just never know how the. Uh, you know, generally, I am basically an intraday trader, and what I try and do is trade in the in the short term direction of the market. Um, I think the market obviously um, constantly gets input from news, and and input from from the technical price levels that, that the uh, currencies trade on. So currencies really trade on sort of two things. This is why it's so, it's so difficult to, to trade them because um, they don't just trade on news and they certainly don't just trade on technicals. I mean, any idiot that, that trades strictly on, on Fibonacci um, deserves to lose all his money um, because uh, technicals are just there simply to inform you about the contour and the color of the price action. They're not there to predict price action going forward. Um, so, uh, the key thing is that you try to combine the best of both. You try to always have a good underlying technical tone and a supportive fundamental tone behind it. And if you can find those setups, you generally have what I call high probability setups. I do two things that are sort of unusual for, for most, um, most of the things that, that, that people teach you. I trade with a negative risk reward ratio. Um, and I try to achieve high probability setups. So what I so I typically trade with a, a 50 point stop. In this particular setup, we trade with a 50 point stop and a 30 point target. And I'm actually fooling around with the idea of uh, cutting my stops to 45 points, basically making a one and a half to one negative risk re reward ratio, and trying to achieve a 70 percent accuracy in the uh, in the setup. Um, the setup actually has been testing quite well, and I'll show you some of the, uh, some of the variants that I, that I tested on. It's been trading around 72%, 74%. But anyways, if you can do uh, one to one and a half negative risk reward, that's right. I trade negative risk reward. If you don't like it and you don't want to hear anything I have to say, be welcome to leave the room because this is uh, my feeling basically is that it's much easier. It's not easy, but it is much easier to – uh, make 70% accuracy on a negative one and a half to one risk reward than it is to make positive uh, accuracy um, on, excuse me, than to make 40% accuracy on a two to one risk reward the other way. The market simply doesn't give you $10 bills for every $5 that you spend in an easy fashion. It always makes you work for it. So you kind of have to take what you can get, especially on a short term trading uh, basis. I mean, if uh, nothing is, uh, is as good an example of this as today's price action, which I'm going to uh, delve into um, further. Um, I am still trading the, uh, the OOs, absolutely, but this is, a, this is a sort of a variant of the OOs because what I think what I like about the RSI setup is it's very similar to the OO in the sense that, that it, it basically tries to be on, on, on the uh, positive side of flow. But I think what, it, what makes it cool is it's a little more precise. Remember, 
the OO setup in many ways is artificial. It sort of says, well, if price goes through 50, it has a reasonable chance to go try to try to go through the uh, through the OO. But that is a um, an overlay construct on what price is doing because sometimes price really sort of you know the momentum really happens around 33 and then it moves all the way to like 87 or 89. Um, and I find that the RSI is a, is a better tool for me in terms of getting into a momentum trade earlier with a greater precision than perhaps the OO is. So yeah, um, and I ignore uh, support and resistance uh, areas on a short-term basis. Support and resistance is there to be broken. So um, if you're constantly worried about support and resistance, you're never going to take trades that could potentially work. Now, of course, you're going to run smack dab in the middle uh, of significant uh, resistance or significant support, and you're going to get hit. But that is the risk you take. You kind of have to uh, say, well, you know, I'm either going to take trades um, on a short-term basis on, a, on, a, on an underlying momentum and go with it, or I'm going to just watch all the support resistance levels and never take any trades at all uh, because, uh, you know, there's a thousand support resistance levels all over the place you, you could uh, create that could prevent you from taking trades. Again, I find support resistance to be, obviously, the 130 support in, in the euro, very strong support, but it's going to get broken. When it gets broken, it's going to be huge. So, what you know, what's the point? Um, you trade on, on a day-to-day -day basis. It either gets hit, it doesn't get hit. Uh, the key thing is, you try to be 70% accurate with, with reasonable stops and exits. Um, you never know when those things are going to get bulldozed over or not. So um, I ignore support and resistance as a, uh, as a tool uh, on a short-term trading basis. On a longer-term trading basis, when I'm trying to look, you know, look at longer-term ideas, yeah, then I think I, it's a relatively valid uh, setup. Anyways, um, let's start with the basic underlying fundamentals of how the RSI trade works. And then I'm going to um, – and then you guys, by the way, chime in. While I'm talking, feel free to chime in, put up questions. Um, take me off topic, do whatever you guys want to do, um, you know, because because we're just going to have a very chilling session here for the next uh, next 20, 20 or 30 minutes. Um, anyways, the first and foremost thing I kind of want to do is um, establish trend, right? So, yeah, Len says the price momentum will break through support resistance on small time frames. I think I think that's been my experience. That's why I kind of ignore support and resistance. Um, anyways. The first thing I kind of want to do is, is just take a look at where is my daily positioning trend. And I use a very, very simple um, tool to kind of put me on the right side or the wrong side of flow. So, uh, and by the way, it, it's, not that it, it's not that this, this, this gives me any kind of a uh, wonderful looking glass or a wonderful crystal ball into the future. But what it does is it sort of just generally tries to put me on the right side of the trade. I use a 10 period SMA. This is a daily chart with a 10 period SMA. And all I really want to do is see, am I, am I above it or below it? If I'm above it, that means my bias is to the upside. That means I only want to take long trades within my setup. If I'm below it, I only want to take short trades with my setup. Now, um, you could make a very interesting point. And I mean, there's a lot of people who, who, who uh, like to say, well, you know, if the price is extended, right, um, off the 10 period SMA, and you get a short signal, wouldn't that be a wouldn't that be a good way to to sort of you know trade back down to the to the SMA? And that's called a reversion to the mean trade. Um, is somebody asking me what is average SLD? Are you serious? You're asking me what is a what is a uh, moving average? Okay, I'm not answering that question. Go back to uh, to uh, Pip School and learn what a moving average is. Um, anyways. Uh, so the point being is that, yes, you could trade reversion, uh, reversion to the mean trade, um, you know, to the downside. But I find it to be much less accurate because generally when the trend takes, for example, here's a, you know, here's a negative move within an uptrend. Here's a negative move within an uptrend. You have a lot of false negatives um, on an uptrend um, and a lot of false positives on a downtrend. So I generally want to try to stay with a uh, uh, false I want to trade. I'm sorry. I want to trade with a true positive and a true negative, right? Instead of a, instead of a false positive, false negative. So, um, in that sense, all this does is it just kind of informs my bias, right? It forms. It informs. It tells me, okay, I want to be only looking at, at upside trades, and I want to be looking at downside trades um, uh, if I'm up or down. So right now, I mean, Euro has actually, despite its miserable existence. Um, has has been in an uptrend, surprisingly enough, since, let me see what date is this, since the 90s, really, like for the last 10 days, the euro, I know it doesn't seem like it, has actually been an uptrend um, on the thing. I'm sorry, yes, I'll be, I don't, don't, don't let me, uh, don't let my cranky New York personality 
uh, stop you from uh, from asking me questions. Um, I didn't mean to yell at you. I just I was just surprised you didn't know what a uh, what a moving average is. Um, anyways, uh, the point being is that what I want to do, and 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 generally what I'm always I'm always taking my signal from the day prior. So just to understand, how is my bias? To, uh, guys, hang on just one second. Hang on, hang on. Hey, Patty. I'm good. Can I? I'm just in the middle of a, uh, a meeting. Can I call you back in a half hour? Okay, we'll do it. All right. Sorry, sorry. That was CNBC. I had to. I had to. Um, uh, to deal with her. Um, oh, I'm using uh, guys. I'm using a very, very, very simple uh, clue to trend, which is the ten. Period daily moving average. You can see it. The SMA, it's the simplest one of all. I'm using a 10 period SMA because again, this isn't. I'm not. All I'm trying to do is ask myself: Is the trend up or the trend down? That's going to inform my decision. That's not going to make my decision. It's just going to inform my bias, right? I'm trying to create a bias. Um, hang on, just one second, guys. I'll be right back. Okay, so I'm trying to inform my bias and. That's what I do when I when I set up the RSI. So in this particular case, I'm always, by the way, pivoting my bias off of yesterday's close. And yesterday's close, just to sort of make sure we really understand each other. My candles close 5 p.m. New York time. Okay, this is the classic standard close of the daily candle. So yesterday, the 5 p.m. New York candle closed at 32.38. The 10 period SMA was 31.85, clearly above the 10 period SMA. That means my bias is to the upside, generally. You know, that's, I want to be taking trades to the upside. Um, and this is just in the euro dollar. Now, uh, I look at trades for this particular setup in the euro dollar, in the pound dollar, uh, in the dollar yen. Dollar yen, by the way, of course, negative, right? Dollar yen in a clearly downtrend, and in the um, in the Austin dollar. So basically, the four primary most liquid uh, major. Now, what's interesting here is Aussie dollar, as of yesterday, gave you positive signals. If the Aussie dollar, so the bias is to the upside, but obviously there's absolutely no no no, no upside uh, trade in the Aussie dollar today. But what's interesting is if the Aussie dollar ends at this price or anywhere lower, it will now change to a negative bias. That means you will not be looking for negative trades in the Aussie dollar over the next couple of days or the next day, of course, um, as your potential setup. So that's my first and foremost filter. I just simply look at the, um, at the daily charts. And as we can see on the daily charts right now, what we have going on is that the euro and the pound are in a clear uptrend. The yen is in a clear downtrend. The Aussie is maybe changing um, changing directions, um, and we'll, we'll know by the end of the day where, where things stand. So now comes the, um, uh, the RSI setup uh, in the way I practice it. So let's just look up. We're going to create a uh, – just tell me if you guys can see. Uh, I will close the daily chart. Close daily chart. You guys can – oops, bear with me, bear with me, bear with me. I'm making this really big. Can everybody see the uh, uh, the hourly chart, right? Does everybody see the hourly chart? Somebody give me a yes or no, so I just want to make sure that, we, that you guys are all seeing it. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, here's the hourly chart, 30-day. This is the euro, right? And what we're going to do is remember that the euro is um, is now in an uptrend, so it's presumably giving us, you know, up signals. Um, and what I do is something that, that I think is a little bit unusual from what how most people kind of look at, uh, at indicators. Remember, I trade momentum. So I sort of turn everything upside down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down the, the RSI 14 period mo uh, moving average, the standard setting, right? I'm just going to change the color to... Uh, to black, I'm going to make it a little medium so you guys can, can see the whole thing. I'm going to lay it over, um, over, over the hourly chart, right? And my setup is very simple. 
what it's a 24 hour day setup. There is no, uh, there is no time filter. And I trade this, I try to trade this on a 24 hour basis. And of course I, I miss a lot of trades. Uh, sometimes I miss them and, and I'm happy. Sometimes I miss them. And of course, um, they turn positive. I'll show you a couple of winners and a couple of losers, um, along the way. Um, but the key underlying pivot is the following. What I'm looking for, most people basically look at RSI and say, oh, I want to sell when it goes to 70. I want to buy when it, when it, when it, when it uh, drops below 30 because they view it as an overbought, oversold indicator. I actually view it the exact opposite. To me, when it approaches towards the 70 level, that means there's a massive amount of interest in the particular currency. And I want to be buyer. Generally, the underlying thesis of what I do is I buy to sell higher and I sell low to sell lower. This is very, very hard for a lot of people to do because most people naturally are bargain hunters. But what you will find in the currency market is that um, positive action begets positive action, negative action begets negative action, more so than the other way around. And if you can reorient yourself mentally towards buying highs and selling lows um, with a proper uh, risk-reward structure and a proper stop-loss functions and, and, and good entries, I think you have a reasonable chance of, of, of doing very well. I certainly have been doing really well with the RSI bunch, and I know a lot of people who follow me um, do, do very well with it. And there's, you know, there's a lot of different permutations that we trade in, in this particular trade. So I'm just giving you sort of the basic one today, which I think is, is really simple. So let's imagine. Remember, we've said that the euro has been in an uptrend since the 19th, right? Because we, we looked at the, uh, at the uh, uh, charts before. Now, today in the room, I'm going to actually reveal a couple of wrinkles to you that will make the RSI bunching job better and more efficient as a setup than uh, what most people have been trading. So the trigger in the RSI bungee jump, you know, the way I've sort of been describing it is 65 or better, I'm a buyer. In other words, once RSI goes to 65 or better, I'm a buyer. Or once it goes to 35 or lower, I'm a seller. But in the truth, what I actually have been doing is I'm adjusting my RSI values to 64 or better. In other words, if the RSI on the hourly, and, and let me give you an example. Let's look at it at a hardcore example. So. Uh, where are we? So here we go. So blah, blah, blah. So here's, we know, we know that, that um, Euro is, is, is in the uptrend on 420, right? RSI 57, RSI 57, RSI 6422. Okay, everybody sees this candle. I'm actually going to mark this candle so you guys can see it. It's uh, this candle over here. So the hourly candle ends at 6422, not quite 65, okay? I love this entry. This is what I've been doing. I actually, if, if it's 64 instead of 65 or above, it gives me an early look into a possible momentum burst, right? So I'm long at 3170. Let's call it 3170 on the close with a target of 3200. Obviously, the, uh, the thing hits very, you know, easily over the next hour and a stop at 50. Uh, what, the reason why this works, I find this works a lot better is because very often you will get this momentum, you know, the, the actual profit momentum happens on the candle right after the 64 trade. Um, so if you had waited longer, if we had waited longer on this particular candle, this next candle registers a reading of 70. Still, still, I think, a valid entry, and you could have entered here, and you still would have been able to squeeze out additional 30 points. But the key thing with, with the RSI setup is that you always want to squeeze out the early 30 points. You, you always want to be as early as possible into the momentum move. So in this particular case, very nice, very smooth, very easy trade right up into, into a 30-point profit. Now, let's take a look at this particular trade. This is a trade where, again, RSI 64.35. Again, above 34. Uh, yes, somebody, uh, Robert is uh, asking a very, very good question. I always, 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 I don't know how many times I can tell this to you, but I really hope you remember it, always wait for the candle to close. Because remember, it's not a signal unless it completes. What happens very often is you'll get, you'll get this sort of uh, intra-candle enthusiasm. But if by the end of the candle, the thing just does not have enough momentum to stay at the upper end of the candle and, and hold a 64 value or better, then that means whatever, is, uh, whatever the underlying buying action is going on, it's really not that strong enough. There's enough doubt. There's enough um, uncertainty within the price action the market is displaying that I don't want to participate in that trade. So 
So yes, I always want to wait. And yes, um, waiting for the candle to close, you sometimes obviously, you know, miss uh, the big moves that um, uh, that occur in the candle. You know, you, you miss the big first. But <coughs> in this particular case, it doesn't matter. It's better to sort of buy up and be more certain than buy intra-candle and then see a reversal uh, going your way. Because because a lot of times what you'll see sometimes, you'll see this incredible burst, and then intra-candle, you get a reversal, and the candle actually turns into a, uh, into a shooting star, which is the death knell of this setup. Um, I don't quite understand the FX learner's question. How can you tell a false 65% RSI by candle? Um, there's no such thing as a false 65%. It's either 65, you know, it's easy, it, it has to close. If it closes and it gives you a reading of 64 or better, that's a uh, positive signal and you take the trade. Now, does it work out? Always, of course not. Uh, you're hoping that it only fails 30% of the time. Uh, uh, yeah, I still don't understand what you mean by false 65%. Uh, it, it, it's true if it ends, if the candle completes. If the candle completes at 60, um, 64% or better, it's great. Now, if, are you asking me, how do I know that this trade is not going to go against me? I don't. That's the whole point of trading. You don't, you know, I can't, uh, I can't tell you this is a 100% guaranteed setup. That's impossible. Um, you have a very nice handle, FX Learner. The first thing you need to learn is that you're going to lose money. And if you don't want to lose money, you should never trade. The idea in trading is not about avoiding losses. The idea is to, um, uh, is to minimize your losses. Uh, the 65 RSI, it's, it's, based, it's all based on 60. I'm um, basically, uh, this is an indicator based setup. It's, it's gonna, the price can be 37, 47, 89. 1,100 and, and uh, 811 and, and four pips to the, to the nth degree. The price is what I'm entering at. Um, what the signal is, is from the RSI. So in this particular case, again, signal is 64.35, right? Right above my 64 threshold line. I'm long here. It takes a while. I think it probably takes like 11, 12 hours and you hit the 30 points. I actually think I have this trade in my book and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a couple of my trades in my books um, and you'll, you'll see how they, they're playing out. Um, but anyways, that's the setup in, in its essence. You, what you're trying to do, um, one four seven one eight. What is my probability success? My probability success with uh, with the uh, RSI strategy in this particular case so far, and again, it's just a small sample, so you can't take my word for it. Has been better than seventy percent. Um, it's actually been, been, been testing, it's been running like at around 72, 73%. But um, you're going to run into, into, into the big slides. One of the interesting things, by the way, is that for some reason, you know, when we've tested the setup on, on, on back data, the one year that was absolutely horrid, just, I mean, so horrid that it barely broke even for a whole year, was 2009. Now, 2009 happened to have been a, um, a year of, of high volatility, and very, very um, strong reversals, you know, intraday reversals. So when you have these kind of massive moves intraday, where literally, I mean, Europe was moving 200 pips a day every single day. When you have large, large volatility, I think um, this kind of a continuous trending setup is, is obviously very vulnerable. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're, if you're, if you're going to enter in an environment where, um, where the volatility expands tremendously, the stops may be, may be too small or perhaps – um, the the push pull nature of that kind of a uh, uh, thing. Yes, I, I held trades overnight. I held trades. You know, some of these trades, like you can see this particular trade. Oh, somebody knocked me out of my trade. Okay, um, doesn't matter. I'm gonna I'm gonna sh I wanted to show you uh, some live trades. Um, anyways, so you guys can see it. So anyways, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Okay, here's a good example. So so this is a trade that I was talking to you about. You, uh, I'm sorry, do you guys. I'm sorry. Did anybody? Does everybody see the uh, the charts here? The uh, the black charts. Does everybody see the euro dollar or no? Okay, you guys see the euro dollar, the pound dollar. Yeah, okay. I just, I didn't I didn't know if you guys see my see my thing. Okay, okay, okay. So we're gonna look at some we're gonna look at some charts that um, that I traded. Um, so anyways, so here's a perfect example. This was I think this was the 24th of April, right? Euro euro. I go long. It's it's in an uptrend. It's uh, the RSI on this was. 
where are we? 64.39, right? Um, and this is an hourly chart, by the way. This is one of the interesting things is that for a short-term setup, it sure takes a long time to resolve. Let's count the hours. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 hours. That took almost, you know, 24 hours to resolve. Sometimes it can take a really long time. And the other thing I'll tell you is I'm very, very um, adamant about just staying to my stops, right? I either I either uh, take the and I the stops. Um, anyways, all right. So euro. This was a this is kind of a very very long trade that, that that took a long time to work out. Let's take a look at the uh, yen. Remember I showed you that the yen was uh, in a downtrend, right? Let me see if I can find you the yen trades. Where the hell is my yen trades? Okay. Well, this is early. I'm sorry. I don't have any. I thought I had a short yen trade for some reason. Uh, okay. Maybe I had a short yen trade in another account, but anyways, this is a long yen trade. This was this was like when when the yen was actually in an uptrend, and here's you know here's a long yen trade where we we go 8140. Um, uh, I know why I know I know why I got confused. I'll explain to you in a second. So 8140. Here's a here's a here's a uh, yen trade, and one of the things that I kind of uh, want to show you is that it's uh, it again it takes a long time. Are you still seeing the euro? Why am I not? Okay, let me see if I can. Okay, now you guys seeing the yen? Okay, sorry. So you know, I think I know. I think I know what I'm going to do. I'm just I'm just simply going to change the uh, uh, the charts this way. I'm not going to have to bounce around. Um. Anyway, so here's a here's a yen trade from the 18th. Again, very long time to develop the trade. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. We're not to do twenty-four hours, really, 24 hours, really full twenty-four hours to develop this trade. Now, one of the things I kind of wanted to show you is that yesterday, right? This is my own fault. So yesterday, we are. Let's go to yesterday. We're at the twenty-ninth of uh, of April, and the yen was in a clear downtrend, right? And here the RSI is well below the 34 level, right? In other words, if you start if you start the day fresh, their RSI is in 30. And I should have taken the short over here. I did not take the short. I simply was um, just too distracted with other trades. And this is a classic example where you need to just basically trust the idea that yes, you think it's oversold. Yes, you think it's so so low. It's close to that 80 level. This is I remember this is a perfect example of me being you know the idiot support. 80 support. It's not going to break support. I don't, I don't want to get short, right? Well, it was a very, very stupid idea because taking the short here would have been a very, very sweet trade right down as the support is um, uh, is broken. Okay, screen is tiny. Let's make the screen big. So, anyways, the point being is that is that you, the, the support um, argument that you guys always you know that is always made it's kind of stupid. Here's 80. It broke through 80 like like uh, like a knife through uh, through hot butter and uh, would have made some very, very nice um, uh, change. Let me just look at, let's look at, let me just see what we have on the, do I have Aussie trades, Aussie trades. I'm trying to find, because um, I, I was away, um, I was away for the last couple of days. So I hadn't, I hadn't uh, made uh, any trades um, uh, in the calendar. But let's see, here's an Aussie trade. This is a classic Aussie trade, right? Aussie was in, in a downtrend. I think this was the, uh, the time when we had low inflation expectations. Uh, the RSI here is, let's go to the RSI. You guys can see it on the bottom, 34.11, right? Really right below, actually below the 36. Short here, boom. Nice, easy trade uh, to the upside. Um, let's go look for the pound trades. Pound is, pound is like one of the most notoriously difficult currencies to trade. And yet, this is the one setup where um, it really kind of works on the pound. Now, in the pound, um, there are two types of setups I, I, I work on. Remember I said to you, I primarily just buy highs and sell lows. But there was occasions, and this was, this was, this was one of those occasions, where... Um, if the pound is in an uptrend, right, that means it's above the 10-period SMA, and the RSI goes below the uh, the oversold level of 30, and then comes back up above 30, right? I call this my RSI value setup. This is the idea for those of you who don't want to buy um, highs and sell lows, but want to buy low in an uptrend and sell high in a uh, in a downtrend, then. Um, this is a perfect setup for you. The RSI value that basically, remember, on the broader scheme of things, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the pound dollar is an uptrend. Trust me on this. Uh, this was a, uh, I'm trying to remember what the hell this was. 
what if I, I remember posting, I remember tweeting about this and then somebody called me an, a complete moron and then, and then saw themselves get stopped out. Um, ugh. I forgot what, the, what this was the 25th of April. There was something going on about, uh, oh, GDP, that's what it was. It was UK GDP, right. UK GDP comes in really negative, but remember, GDP, first of all, is really backward-looking data. So my view is, hey, the pound has actually been a very strong uptrend. It's backward-looking data. I think the market is going to shake it up, and if the market gives me a signal to buy, I'm going to get long and buy it. So, yeah, you know, I go long and buy it. In the meantime, just, you know, uh, everybody on Twitter was calling me an idiot because the GDP was horrible. How could I be possibly buying pounds? And it's a perfect example where this is very important. If the price action goes one way and the data goes the other way, the rule of thumb is to always trust the price action, right? Always trust the price action. So um, I trusted the price action, and, of course, it, you know, it, it, it made nice bank here. Here's the, 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 the pound is, is obviously in, in an uptrend here. This is me in Vancouver when I was, uh, when I was away from the desk with my daughter when we were traveling, and I just took a, you know, I, this was just so easy that you could, so easy you could trade from your hotel room. So this was uh, a trade that I took um, when we were in Vancouver last week where the pound was in such a strong uptrend. It sent a very nice strong signal during, um, uh, during the 5 o'clock hour. I bought, I, you know, I closed my eyes, I didn't, I didn't look at it, and then three hours later it made the trade. Now here's a good example of, of me being an idiot, okay? And um, I just want to show this to you because I'm, I'm almost certain I'm going to get stopped out in this trade. So um, remember, the pound... Definitely is trading a little bit heavy today, but on a longer term time frame, which is on a daily time frame, it is still above the 10 period SMA, right? So rule number one is my bias should be to the long side, right? But today I decided, you know what? I don't care that the, 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 the pound uh, is still showing me a long term bias on the upside. The um, PMI data was pretty horrid, and the underlying thesis for why the pound was being bought was that the Q, Q2 recovery was going to be strong. But now the Q2 recovery is actually maybe under under serious question, right? So, yes, fundamentally, we can always make lots of different interesting arguments and convince ourselves of anything. Remember, what is the single most dangerous thing in life? Rationalization, right? We can go uh, 24 hours or 40 hours without water. We can go 10 days without, um, without food. We can't go more than two minutes without rationalization. So this is a perfect example of rationalization. I simply say, oh, you know, I, I, I don't care that, that the bias is up. I'm going to get short. So I get short here, right? And actually, I would have been very, very lucky very, very lucky, and got taken, you know, got taken to, to profit on this spike off of the very, very positive U.S. PMI data. And I may still, I might still make the trade. But honestly, even if I make the trade, it's actually the wrong lesson to learn. The lesson here being is that um, I would have been lucky, not good. And remember, um, even though Yogi Berra said I'd rather be lucky than good, and maybe that sometimes works in baseball, over the long term, you much rather be good than lucky because luck runs out, but goodness lasts. So even if this trade kind of works for me, it's still the wrong trade to trade. Fortunately, this is this is my this is my uh, what I call my play account, right? This is this is kind of my my small account where I trade uh, small lots and I do a lot of experimentation. I show you some you know some uh, uh, some trades, uh, and I did not make this. Um, uh, I did not make this uh, you know in my in my regular account, which 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 traded very very nicely. Um, and I've been, I've been doing very, it's been really building very nicely as far as uh, RSI data goes over the last um, month and a half. So why do I trade RSI opposite to others? The reason why is because I believe that it actually sends you a much better signal when it, when it, when it reaches a momentum. Remember, when RSI is trading 65 or above or 34 or below, there is a massive consensus of positive or negative price action, right? I mean, RSI is like a temperature gauge. It's basically a thermometer. It tells you, hey, things are hot or things are cold. So when the majority thinks that people think things are cold, um, the natural inclination of rookie traders is to say, oh, that means the price is going to go the other way. But in fact, what you get paid for in the market is to be on the side of the majority, not on the side of the minority. It may be very brave and maybe morally superior. It may be philosophically attractive. It may be very, very um, uh, interesting for you to be the loner in a crowd. But in fact, you get paid by being with the crowd. Um, in your regular life, you're welcome to be an iconoclast. But when you're a trader, especially if you're a short-term trader, you really want to trade with the crowd, not against it. Um, that's been probably the single biggest lesson of my whole life. 
and the lesson took me a very long time to learn. And I, it's only after I learned that lesson that I've actually became consistently profitable. So with that little bit of folk wisdom, I think I'm going to wrap up the, uh, the session for you guys. Um, any questions that you have, uh, fire away. We've got about five, ten minutes, so let's, uh, let's rock and roll, and uh, you guys tell me what, you, uh, what you're thinking. Um, yeah, Len, um, Len is making an interesting question of whether it's, it would be good on a 50-minute chart. The problem, I will tell you this, um, the problem is this. You're absolutely right. They could send a lot of very false signals. And also, um, what I find is I, you know, I find that the more times you trade, the more mistakes you make. So I generally want to, when I'm trading, when I'm trading intraday, when I'm trading short term, I'm basically looking for one or two trades a day. I think if you trade more than two times a day on any given particular pair, your chances of failure are much larger than your chances of success. Now, you know, that's one of the reasons is because you're actually trading against, uh, against spread. You're trading against um, the broader market. And you're trading against some very, very short edge staple. In other words, imagine put, putting yourself um, at a 20-point stop. I can get stopped out literally 10 times in a day on a 20-point stop and not once on a 50-point stop, right? And the whole idea is, 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 as I said, it's not the idea in, in, in trading is not to avoid losses but to minimize them. And one way I want to minimize my losses is by giving myself ample enough of a stop that I don't get stopped out by noise. So I hope, um, I hope you guys agree with that. Um, my risk reward, Dan, is 50 stop, 30 TP, but I'm very, very seriously playing around with the idea of uh, making my stop 45, not 50, but 45, to make it a one and a half to one negative uh, risk reward. And the inverse risk reward is because obviously um, I'm looking for high profit. There's only two ways you can trade. You can either trade high profit or high probability. High probability means if you want to trade more than 50% accuracy, then your risk reward has to be negative. And if you want to trade, uh, you know, home runs, three to one risk reward ratios, then expect to win 10% of the time. So there's no way you're going to win 50% of the time making three to one risk reward ra ratios. And there's no way um, you're going to be 70% accurate by giving yourself um, a two to one, uh, by giving yourself a, a ten point stop and a and a, um, um, uh, and, and, and a twenty point target, uh, trust me on that. Uh, if you if you can give me a thousand trades that disproves me, I will give you a thousand dollars. But you know you may disprove me on ten trades, you may disprove me on this on a hundred trades, but you'll never disprove me on a thousand trades on that. Uh, Ron's making a great question. A great question. He's saying some currencies move more percent a day than others. He's basically talking about ATR, average true range of the currency pair, um, which is why generally I, I pretty much and, and you're right that you know the, the pound is perhaps should have better adjustments than uh, than um, the euro. But honestly, you know if you look at the euro, the pound, um, the Aussie, and the yen, there's enough movement in there for 30 for 30 points to the upside, 50 points to the other side, um, so that uh, I generally just apply a single a, a single strategy to all the four currency pairs. If I was trading pound yen, if I was trading pound Swiss, if I was trading maybe euro Aussie, I certainly you know I'd have to make those adjustments. But I try to stay simple, clean, and consistent. Well, you know, Dan, if you're, you know, if you're winning like 20% of the time, you may still be winning. I just, I, I don't know, um, you know, how, how well your trading is going. I'm actually kind of curious. You guys feel free. We've got like a couple of minutes if you want to share some of your trading stories. Um, like, you know, Dan, you're saying you're trading with 3 to 1 risk reward ratio. Have you, had a, have you done an analysis of how many, how many accurate trades you've made? And what is a 3 to 1 risk reward ratio? How many pips are you actually risking? How many pips are you actually looking to get? You know, because three three pips t uh, three a one pip stop and a three pip TP target is not a three to one risk reward ratio. <laughs> um, Israel, what did you did you need me to repeat something? I see you said repeat that. I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to.
Um, Rob is making an actually great point that uh, – oh, the risk reward, sorry, sorry, so I hope that's clear to you. Uh, Rob is making a great point. Um, systems that win very infrequently, right, um, also suffer from, from double damage. And the double damage is this. Um, if you win, like, let's say, only 30% of the time, it's very statistically possible for you to win only 10% of the time for a very long period of time. And that could just literally bleed you down to nothing in terms of, in terms of your drawdown. So, um, so that's why um, I prefer to trade high probability versus high risk, high reward. I have not tried combining any other indicators with RSI. I try to basically, generally, for those of you who know me, I try to trade with as little indicators as possible. It's all about price action. Um, the, I look, view the RSI as basically a thermometer. I am like an old country doctor. You know, if your temperature is high, I, I know you're kind of sick. If your temperature is, you know, low, I know you're, you know, you're frozen, whatever. Uh, I guess the, the analogy kind of falls apart there. But anyways, the point being is I don't really need a lot of um, indicators to tell me what the, uh, what the sentiment is because what, ultimately what I'm trying to trade is sentiment, right? And sentiment is affected by two things. Sentiment is affected by the price action itself and by the news flow surrounding, right? The two things that people kind of have a hard time understanding is that positive news creates its own monster, or excuse me, positive prices create its own monster. In other words, people buy just because prices are going up. It's human nature. It's kind of the stupidity of human nature. It's not because there's value. It's not because it's great ideas. It's not because, because it's, it's super, uh, uh, super interesting from an investment point of view. They buy because it's going up. They sell because it's going down to some extent until eventually the cycle breaks and it goes the other way. So um, that is what sentimental trading is really all about, and I, and I use RSI to just gauge my sentiment levels. So you're using 20 risk, 60 reward, 25% so far. Um, so obviously, you know, one out of four trades is positive. Um, so you're making, I guess you're net even then at that point, right? You're making three trades at plus, at minus, um, 20 and one trade at plus 60, so you're, you're not even. Yeah, so, you know, that's not where you want to be. That's why I said it's markets very rarely give you, uh, give you a, a penny, penny for a dollar. Um, everybody wants a lottery ticket when, in fact, you know, you want to be trading the other. You want to be the lottery, you know. All right, guys. Um, Time is up. I hope you guys found this uh, interesting and um, uh, rewarding. I want everybody to go to uh, uh, BK Forex. Check us out. Um, we trade a lot of these ideas in a much more – oops. Oh, where do we go? Um, we trade a lot of these ideas. Um, wait, what happened? For some reason I'm losing you guys. Are you guys losing me? Okay, I just turned off the camera. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to uh, just send my uh, uh, my website. Everybody come hit the website. Uh, there's a lot of free information there. There's a lot of YouTube videos there that explains a lot of stuff. So um, I hope you guys will find it. I don't use stocks. I don't use Williams. I don't, they're, they're all derivatives of the same thing. Um, you know, so I, uh, RSI is nice and clean and simple. It's been around since 1972 by Wells Wilder. And um, most importantly, it works, which is really the only the only test that I really care about. Simple trading um, that that tries to keep you on the right side of the trend. Uh, so I hope you guys liked it, uh, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, follow me on Twitter. In, in, if there's FX Flow, baby, um, you're not in the know if you don't follow FX Flow. I, I tweet all the time, and um, I hope you guys uh, join me if you don't follow me. I wish you guys the best, and I and I'll see you guys next next uh, month. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much.